uh, Dr. Chima. Welcome to this CIRS webcast, which is part of the recently launched web-based project on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Gulf and broader Middle East. The goal of this project is to provide insightful analysis and understanding of the broader social, cultural, and economic dimensions of the region's response to the pandemic and its impact on the population. Uh, so first, let me introduce you to our listeners. Uh, Dr. Sohela Chima is the director of the Institute for Population Health and Assistant Professor of Healthcare Policy and Research at Wild Cordell Medicine in Qatar. Um, there she actively participates in oversight and implementation of the IPH education, research, and community programs. And she also co-directs and teaches the pre-medical course, Health and Disease, a Global Perspective. Uh, Dr. Chima, you've been involved in a few CRS initiatives over the past several years. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to have a conversation with you today on the overall impact of the pandemic on other aspects of healthcare, as these national systems are being reoriented to focus almost entirely on COVID-19. Uh, so Dr. Chima, thank you for agreeing to this interview. And I'd like to start by first asking you, um, what, do you what do you see as the future of healthcare systems um, what, what will it look like uh, in the coming months um, until a vaccine is made available? You know, right now people are going into hospitals mostly for emergency situations, um, not going so much for routine care. Um, patients are asked to call in to talk to a doctor and get prescriptions. Um, so is this how healthcare might look like for this foreseeable future? So what are your insights on this? So Elizabeth, firstly, I would like to thank you and CRRS for inviting me, you know, to participate in these uh, conversations, which are very timely in, in view of the current COVID-19 pandemic. So thanks again for the invitation. And it is my pleasure, you know, to be here with you all. So thank you for that first question to start us off. Fantastic question. I, I think it's the million dollar question everybody uh, probably wants to learn a little bit more about. For now, you know, the term future, uh, it, it just, you know, I think there's so much uh, uncertainty. The situation is evolving so much. You know, it's, it's difficult for us to sort of, you know, even predict what the future is really going to look like. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, maybe premature for us to foresee at, at the current timing you know, how healthcare is really going to evolve. Uh, but, I mean, it's going to be a challenging journey. I mean, you know, I think there are several unknowns, many gaps, you know, which, which we will fill in as the situation evolves. Uh, so again, I think let's put things into perspective, you know, about why hospitals have shifted to using, you know, maybe telephone or digital technology more so at the current time. So again, we have to remember, you know, that we are responding to a public health crisis right now. So we do not want to burden, you know, the existing healthcare systems, uh, you know, so really, you know, the healthcare systems are trying to postpone all non-essential appointments and surgeries and things like that. So that they have enough resources, you know, enough protective equipment available for the frontline healthcare workers who are really battling with the pandemic at the frontline. Uh, so they have emerged, you know, phone, digital technology are emerging as a key strategy to manage the demand right now on, on the hospital and healthcare systems. But I think one very important point for us to remember is that this also reduces the exposure and potential spread of the virus, you know, among healthcare professionals, patients, the communities. Uh, and I think as we sort of see and what we're seeing around the world, you know, as the peak is reduced, hospitals will be ready to safely treat patients, you know. So obviously they also realize that people want continuity of care of the routine care that they were getting. And again, I think the systems are getting ready, you know, to sort of uh, respond to those needs, you know, again, keeping, you know, uh, in line with the guidelines that the government may have and the guidance that they may have. And like any other high income country, you know, Qatar's healthcare system is very well equipped to do so. Um, I think uh, what we really have to be uh, cognizant of is, you know, the marginalized people, the poor, the migrant communities, you know, 
and make sure that they also have access to all this digital technology, right? Because they may not be digitally literate. Uh, they may know, not know what to do in these situations exactly. So we need to be more cognizant of these marginalized populations. You know, again, the elderly that we have, you know, who, are, who we know are more at risk from COVID-19. And also, you know, I think we are aware and people are talking about what the toll of this pandemic is going to be for people who were otherwise, you know, reporting to hospitals and clinics. You know, is there going to be a delay in screening and, and other procedures which were being done, you know, uh, which would impact the health of people? Um, so I think everybody is aware of these situations. You know, there might be the other aspect of the worried well, you know, who might seek unnecessary care and again, you know, try to further burden the healthcare system. So I think one thing which is very clearly coming out and which is really going to be have to be taken into consideration is looking at the social determinants of health. Uh, if, if we don't take care of our vulnerable populations, of our marginalized populations, we are actually not taking care of our own health. So we, we have to remember, you know, that we do not leave them behind. So once I think the peak is reduced, hospitals are sort of gearing, you know, now to get ready to treat patients, receive them safely. Uh, and as it really evolves, the pandemic evolves, you know, the healthcare system is also going to change, you know, in response to that situation. Uh, so I think we might be seeing, you know, like sort of a two-tier system, uh, you know, maybe have one system where you sort of have COVID-19 patients who are being treated and then a parallel sort of uh, system running where you are responding to patients or reporting for routine care and obviously emergency care uh, continues. So there, there might be different ways of triage happening you know, a lot more digital technology being utilized. Uh, there's definitely going to be, you know, careful uh, monitoring of people entering you know, hospitals and healthcare systems, additional screening, you know, of patients, of visitors coming in, uh, maybe universal masking procedures that everybody as Qatar guidelines also say right now, you know, when you go to situations where you're going to be uh, exposed to more people, you know, everybody wears a mask, you know, so having those waiting areas now sort of marked with uh, physical distancing, you know, in mind, uh, enhanced cleaning of rooms and disinfection happening. Uh, so again, these are some of the things that I foresee, you know, maybe happening, there may be virtual check-ins, you know, happening. We just really have to remember that, you know, each patient who comes to us is really a unique person, you know, so every patient has their own needs. And again, healthcare systems, you know, are going to be responding to those needs. And I think Qatar is very well placed in, in terms of, you know, digital technology and uh, the networks that they have available to shift to this kind of care if, if need be. So I, I foresee, you know, yes, definitely some changes. Um, a vaccine is definitely, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but uh, we also have to understand, you know, that a vaccine is not like a magic bullet, which is going to take care of everything, uh, all the problems associated with COVID-19. So th those are some of my thoughts right now on how healthcare may evolve and, and continue. Thank you very much. That's very uh, interesting, um, especially thinking about a kind of um, parallel stream of having COVID-related um, patients in one area and um, other issues in another area. I think, um, at least from my experience here in Qatar, it seems um, there's already some kind of bifurcation there with um, uh, all of the COVID care being done at Hamad, at the state hospital, from my understanding. And the private hospitals are doing um, other other care as needed. Um, so that that's very interesting to hear you talk about that. Um, so I have another big question for you. Then, uh, do you think is the biggest challenge for the healthcare system in Qatar and in the region uh, due to this pandemic? I think you know um, Qatar and the region. I mean, it's quite a mixed region, right? So we are. Um, a mixture of uh, high, middle, and low-income countries in the region. 
You know, so I think uh, one of the challenges, like I already alluded to earlier, is basically, you know, in, in the Gulf states, we have a large migrant population, you know, so a lot of the other communities, you know, we are all blessed and privileged, you know, uh, to be living the way we are. And we don't have any problems with digital literacy and, and, you know, having access to all the tools that we may need. But I think it's very important, like I said, you know, to focus more on the marginalized and the vulnerable populations, you know, try and understand what the issues are there. And I definitely know because, you know, we recently we did an elective with the Ministry of Public Health where some of our students actually went in, you know, to see the work which was being done on the field by the Ministry of Public Health here. I mean, there's tremendous work going on, you know, uh, in terms of contact tracing, in terms of uh, isolating, you know, people and trying to make sure, you know, that we're mitigating spread. There is a lot of communication happening among the migrant population, you know, because they may not all have access to, you know, pamphlets or material which is being, you know, sort of propagated or disseminated via the internet. So again, talking to them, you know, having those focus group discussions with them, you know, key informant interviews to understand what are the challenges that they are currently facing, uh, you know, to see what we can do from their perspectives. You know, every community has um, a different culture, a different belief, a different perspective. So in healthcare, we must understand, you know, all those different aspects before we even think, you know, that we're gonna try and address health. Uh, you know, so the determinants of health are extremely important, the social determinants. Uh, so a lot of work is happening on ground here in Qatar, you know, and, and I'm sure in the other high income countries in the region. Uh, but again, I think uh, in some of the low and middle income countries, some of the barriers or the challenges might be, again, digital literacy, you know, financial constraints, you know, the COVID-19 has, like we know, turned our world upside down. People in low and middle income countries, you know, a lot of them have informal, you know, employments, they're daily wage earners, you know, so people have lost their livelihood. They don't know how, if they're gonna have food on the table the next day. So again, really to be looking at, you know, the governments, you know, to the globally, to other, you know, uh, funding sectors to sort of see if financial packages can be released, you know, and governments can sort of take those measures we have made considerable, you know, um, improvement in sort of reaching our sustainable development goals in terms of reducing poverty. But I just am seeing, you know, the rates of unemployment, you know, people going into isolation and depression and anxiety and all the problems. So whatever, you know, advancement we had made in that regard, we may be going back to that, which is really, really sad to see. So, you know, again, healthcare systems in low and middle income countries, you know, uh, they may not be able to sort of, you know, uh, carry the burden of the disease. You know, they might be inequitable access to digital healthcare. Uh, the other thing we know, yes, younger generations are expected to have more better literacy, you know, digitally, whereas our older populations, you know, are at risk. They are not so digitally literate. And again, we know COVID-19, you know, definitely affects the older population, 60 and above. So we have to be mindful of those populations, you know, people who are living uh, with comorbidities, you know, like diabetes or cancer who are already immunocompromised, you know. So again, it adds to the burden, you know, that, okay, people sort of already are dealing with those and now they're more fearful you know, for their lives, you know, that if they go out, if they step out, you know, they might acquire the, in the COVID-19. Um, and also, you know, the cost associated with acquiring technology, you know, there might be poor internet uh, access, you know, and it again may prohibit certain from accessing digital healthcare, uh, especially in low and middle income countries. So I, I, I think uh, as things evolve, you know, as more data, data comes out, as more research is done, 
you know, we, we're going to get really a clearer picture of what really the impact is uh, of, uh, you know, COVID-19 or is going to be. Uh, until then, you know, the situation is still fluid, you know, evolving. Um, every country, I think, is trying to do whatever they can. But I, I think one lesson that we've learned is that we're just not prepared sufficiently for any kind of future pandemic. I mean, there were several warnings, you know, a lot of reports, work was done, but definitely not enough. We were not ready for this pandemic. Thank you for that. Um, so coming back to the idea of the digital literacy and that being a barrier for um, not just getting healthcare um, for some populations, but also just um, learning about the risks. Um, so this communication and public education about, um, about COVID-19 um, and the risks and mitigation measures that people can put in place. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, um, about the, the communication of risk in these communities? Um, what are some, some ways to work around this digital literacy, um, digital, digital Ill illiteracy um, and other areas of this, of this, of this. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so Elizabeth, thank you for that question. It's an excellent question. I mean, we all know that risk communication is key in any kind of public health crisis. So again, when we are looking at risk communication, it has several aspects, you know, so we really have to look at the community. I mean, who am I talking to? And then again, choose the right person. Who is the messenger going to be? Can I bring in people from their own community, train them so that they can go and talk to them? Are they going to trust that person more? Because again, developing a trust right from the beginning is crucial. If, if, if the communities don't trust the guidance that they're receiving, you know, uh, they are not going to be able to follow the guidance that you're giving them or adhere to it. So that the trust element you know, is very, very important. We have to choose the messenger correctly, right? Again, in some areas, if there are religious scholars who can help us, you know, spread that information, then we should be utilizing those. Are there any, you know, champions, you know, who people listen to, like, uh, you know, it could be radio show hosts or television, you know, actors and actresses who people really relate to and look up to, they can help us get that information out to them. So again, I think there are several mechanisms, but for us to really understand, you know, what the audience is, what, what is the message that I wanna get across, keeping in mind, like I alluded to earlier, you know, the culture, the social aspects, their beliefs, you know, their literacy levels. So everything is so crucial to be addressed, you know, so otherwise we are not going to get adherence about guidance, about you know, people trying to mitigate risk. We are gonna be putting in a lot of effort but not seeing you know, a lot of results. So risk communication is key and, and we need people you know, who are experts at it. You know, so again, having those focus group discussions, making sure we know what the community needs, it's extremely important to see all of that. Thank you. Um, so uh, one last question, I want to be mindful of your time here. I think you've been very generous in your time. Um, so coming back, I guess, to the question about um, the burden on the health system. Um, so as you mentioned, you know, Qatar has a very, mo um, very mobile population. Um, and so a lot of, um, a lot of migrants um, will uh, um, do a lot of health care um, at home, or they will travel um, to get uh, medical to get medical care. Um, so how do you see the restrictions around um, travel uh, for the uh, COVID-19 impacting people who, who travel for medical reasons, either to their home countries or other, other countries to get the, the care they're looking for? Thank you, Elizabeth. That, that's another good question. And uh, I would really just like to start with, you know, putting things into perspective about this. Uh, so, you know, you may have heard the term medical tourism, you know, uh, again, which comes to mind when we talk about, uh, you know, people traveling, uh, you know, to other countries than their own countries where they're residing, you know, for medical treatment, you know, so that is what it is. 
So prior to the pandemic, yes, we definitely were seeing an increasing trend, you know, uh, for people to travel globally to receive care. Um, and if you look at the medical tourism industry, you know, and some reports actually quoted at being a worth US dollars $100 billion industry. But if you look at the population, you know, people don't have or there's not enough data or research done as yet uh, as to how many people actually travel for medical reasons. But some figures say uh, 750,000, you know, on an annual basis. But with a population in billions, you know, so 750,000 is a very small, tiny percentage of a select group of people who are actually, you know, traveling for uh, medically related reasons. So, uh, again, if, if we look at some of the reasons as to why people were traveling, you know, uh, and, and look at what, what were those reasons. So obviously they're not traveling for acute medical conditions. You know, so most of them were traveling either for surgical procedures, which could be, you know, related to cardiac health. You know, bariatric surgery uh, was, was one of the common procedures people were going to get done. People might be traveling for orthopedic procedures like hip replacement, you know, knee surgery. Uh, and then also a lot of cosmetic procedures or fertility treatments. Uh, so the other thing was also, so again, if we look at some of the reasons, you know, why were people sort of traveling for these reasons, you know, to other countries? So again, it could be because of financial reasons, because the treatments that are being offered in their country might be very expensive. And, and I know some of the reports mention, uh, you know, India, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, you know, to have become big hubs of medical tourism. And actually, governments of Malaysia and Thailand actually support medical tourism. But again, so people could be traveling from other high income countries like Australia or the US, you know, and go for some surgical procedures. And I can give you an example of the cost if, if it's cost, costing. Uh, like a hip replacement in the US is $75,000. In, in Malaysia and India, it may be up to 9,000 to 11,000 US dollars. You know, so people might be going because of that, that is less, or there might be long wait times, you know, in, in their countries. Or also, you know, if they're terminally ill patients, you know, who were going, you know, to trying to sort of seek other treatments, you know, which may not be sort of available or approved in their own countries. So I think it's it's uh, important to remember that yes, even though you know this provided an opportunity you know for people to go, uh, you know to sort of get their problems treated, uh, but there were also challenges associated with it, you know, and and some of the challenges could be you know uh, your rights in in the country that you're going to. If if there's going to be a medical complaint, how are you going to handle that? You know, again complications from surgeries might happen. You know, there might be uh, antibiotic resistance. You know, if, if you finish with the treatment, go back to your own home country. So again, you know, those things need to be kept in mind also that yes, it definitely provided opportunities, you know, for people to travel, but there are also challenges, you know, and even ethically, you know, if people are going to seek sort of treatments which are not yet approved, you know, how ethical is it really, you know, for people, you know, to sort of be giving those treatments to them. So those are some of the, you know, perspectives uh, I sort of see, you know, there was a small population which was going for these. And again, as sort of, you know, the pandemic evolves, you know, we will have a clearer picture of, again, what was really the effect of, you know, people who wanted to travel for medically related conditions, uh, you know, what, what was really the effect of that. Uh, but again, like, you know, if we talk about our, in, in our Gulf states, you know, a majority of the population is our migrant, you know, workers. So what I do know that, you know, the migrant workers, at, at least for Qatar, you know, I, I know um, that every two years, they probably go back to their countries, you know, of origin. 
uh, for them to sort of be traveling, you know, for health related issues is not going to be sustainable. So it's not that population, you know, which is affected uh, from, uh, you know, travel and, and health. Uh, I think the Qatar government here is doing a fantastic job, you know, in looking after the low income workers you know, providing them with adequate coverage, you know, the emergency care that they're providing them. I've actually visited, you know, some of the healthcare centers here. And to my knowledge, there are three of them which are just designated, you know, for the migrant health workers where they can go uh, and seek care as needed. Even if they don't have a government card, you know, nobody is denied access to healthcare. And Hamad is definitely there for emergency situations. And as we all know, a lot of the people who are, you know, who are being infected with COVID are the migrants here, but the government is taking good care of them. They're receiving the same treatment that any resident in Qatar would receive. So Qatar has a good stockpile of all the treatments that are right now being recommended you know, for uh, uh, COVID-19. And they're putting all efforts in you know, to make sure they're giving you know, uh, the right to health to everyone. Thank you. Um, so I'll let you have the, the last word here. If there are any major points that we didn't get to in our discussion that you would like to leave our listeners with or key takeaways? Sure. So um, I think I would like to sort of, you know, just um, finish by saying that uh, we definitely need to be better prepared, you know, for pandemics. You know, we I don't think we can say that, oh, there's not going to be another pandemic. I think the question is there, there will be, but when is the next you know, pandemic? Th that's the real question. Uh, so again, like I'd already alluded to, yes, vaccine is, is the light at the, ton at the end of the tunnel, but again, it's not going to be the answer or the perfect magic bullet you know, uh, for everything. Uh, governments, again, need to be working more towards sort of looking at financial security for marginalized groups in our societies. Our community public health and primary care systems, you know, they need to be strengthened, you know. So there also needs to be additional transparency in national and global health monitoring and how we are sharing, you know, that information to protect the health of the world, basically. I mean, we know that health is, it's not about your health. It's, you know, everyone's health now. Health is interdependent. If your health is not protected, I cannot protect my health. Uh, again, to be cognizant of, you know, social cultural variation, you know, in countries in the Eastern Mediterranean region, you know, when we talk about uh, e-health preparedness, you know, and to sort of prepare more, um, and this should really be a wake up call, you know, to include our migrant communities, our refugees, you know, which are there to be included in the current response and also for future, you know, if we have communities like that. And really to go back to the basics of public health uh, across populations and communities so we can strengthen, you know, all different aspects. I think we've so seen a lot of solidarity, you know, where people coming together locally, nationally, globally, and we are seeing that people are trying to help each other with compassion as a community, you know, and I think that should be the message forward that we must care about all members of our community, not forget that we are humans in the first place and that health is not only, you know, for the privileged class, but for all of us in this world. And the last sort of thing to say, you know, to finish off with, to say that we are really only as strong as a society's most vulnerable. So I, I think we all need to stay together and, uh, you know, get through this. Uh, a lot of patience, with a lot of resilience. Uh, there will be positives, there will be some highs and lows. But that's normal. So um, again, thank you. Those, those are my last thoughts as we finish off. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chima. Thank you for your time and for the insightful discussion. And we'll have to invite you back uh, hopefully in a year from now when things are made hopefully a little calmer. <laughs> so yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth.